Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tiasha Hriber, and I'm a marketing assistant here in Alafe. Uh, I would first like to welcome you to today's webinar. And as you probably know, uh, Alafe CTO, Goras Gotovac, who is already on the call, uh, is, has prepared a short introduction to system efficiency and uh, in will solution benefits to this topic. Um, the introduction will take around 20 to 30 minutes. And after that, we will have a Q&A session. We will uh, answer some of your, the questions that you have um, written in the registration form. And after that, we will answer efficiency related questions that, uh, that you will write in the uh, Q&A box. You can see a Q&A box uh, on the, on the um, lower half of the screen. And yeah, from, uh, for now, this is um, everything on my side. Uh, I propose we begin with the introduction and Goras, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Tiasha. Uh, so yeah, today uh, we prepared a topic on uh, efficiency. We called it uh, 360 approach to getting to 1000 kilometer range. So some really nice, good numbers. Uh, I want to mention another number. So for today, uh, almost uh, 300 people applied for this uh, webinar. Uh, this tells me one thing. This uh, topic is obviously quite important to a lot of people. Uh, OEMs, tier ones, uh, partners, suppliers, even competitors are joining this call. Um, and yeah, we are together building the industry. We are together building the, the e-mobility future. Uh, and I'm really happy to discuss this topic today uh, with you and really looking forward to the questions. So, of course, today we'll go through some basics uh, just to get a common understanding. But if there are any detailed questions that, uh, that we you want us to address, that it's definitely good to contact us and to talk uh, directly to us um, and discuss it. So, of course. Um, we first start with uh, an introduction uh, of, of our company before we go into the deeply into the topics. So Elafe Propulsion Technology, for those of you who don't, don't know us, uh, we've been founded in 2006 uh, from the beginning, focusing on the in-wheel motor direct drive technology. And this has been our focus ever since. However, um, since then, we developed not only the in-wheel motor, uh, but also the power electronics and also the control electronics to control uh, multiple uh, wheels at the same time, of course, in a safe way, but uh, also providing some very interesting functions. Uh, this is not uh, a development which is uh, in CAD or in, in uh, uh, some renders. This is development that's been validated on the bench uh, on, on a lot of different uh, validation benches. Uh, and on more than 100 vehicles uh, uh, worldwide, uh, testing, of course, functionality, but also durability, also uh, some, um, uh, some advanced, uh, uh, advanced uh, maneuvers that are done on the vehicle. Uh, by that, we got a really good understanding of uh, what are the important requirements for in-wheel motors, uh, not only in terms of efficiency that we discussed today, uh, but all, all the other requirements that have to do with reliability, durability, um, performance uh, uh, of these motors, integration, servicing, so all, all of these things that are important actually in the end, if you want to sell a car with some technology. So we are happy also to say that, that there are two different models uh, already this year that will come out onto the market where customers will be able to actually buy cars with our technology. Uh, and additional model next year. So this is something that we are really looking forward to and that uh, it's, a, it's an important milestone, not only for us, but I think also for uh, the whole, the whole uh, part of the e-mobility industry that has to do with direct drive motors, especially in wheel motors. Uh, right now, as a company, we've grown to 150 employees um, and uh, we are still growing. We are present in uh, the three major automotive markets. However, our, our headquarter is in Europe. Uh, and we are quite happy to say that we are, our strategy is to innovate and through innovation to, to actually deliver solutions that uh, um, the OEMs uh, will need in the future uh, and also already need today. Now, 
if we if we start with the topic of today, um, I first want to uh, let's say raise the the point of uh, um, how we differentiate um, um, how how we actually split the market the vehicle market up. And usually, when you talk to traditional OEMs, especially um, the key uh, differentiation is by vehicle size. So, for example, the car is either uh, an A uh, an A class or like a city car or, or a mini compact or it can be anything up to an executive, executive full-size car. Um, and this, um, it, let's say it has a lot of um, important reasons uh, uh, from the past, and especially it has to do with the size of the engine, it has to do uh, with the functionality of the car. However, with electric vehicles, vehicles uh, it beca it's becoming more and more important to differentiate not only by size, but I would argue even more so by the user story of the vehicle. Um, you could say also by the mission profile. So you can either say, okay, I'm building a car which is going to go on the track, it's going to be a sports car and it's going, going to go on the highway. Or you can say, I'm going to build a car which is good for the family, but will be you know, really, really fast uh, uh, in acceleration. Or you can build a car that's, that can drive a substantial range uh, um, um, without charging. Or I'm building a car that's going to go 1,000 kilometers, the thing that we are discussing today, or um, a city car for, um, let's say, the, the second car for the family when you go um, within the city to, to go some, um, uh, to do some uh, um, 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 short trips. Or it can be something for a personal mobility, like a family vehicle. So it's really important, actually, when the vehicle is designed to, uh, uh, to be committed to what the vehicle wants to be. So not only how big it, is, big it is, but actually what it wants to be and who is going to buy the vehicle and why they're going to buy it. And of course, you cannot always uh, um, hit, and we know cases from the past where vehicles were des designed really for, for a different purpose and then were adopted by, by a part of the market. But with electric vehicles, with sizing the battery, with choosing the power chain, it's becoming more and more important to actually hit that, uh, that right sweet spot uh, um, uh, with the customer. And interestingly enough, of course, as you can see here, there are uh, some user stories which are really EV specific that are emerging. For example, uh, there really wasn't any, any use for a user story for a car that doesn't need, need filling up uh, or that, uh, that can drive without any additional energy being added. So this is really a new thing. And uh, when you think about these kind of user stories, then you have to also reconsider your whole, um, let's say requirements of, of, uh, of the powertrain and what they will have to do. And, and this is only the beginning. Uh, I did not want to touch uh, autonomous vehicles, but they also change a lot how the powertrain actually needs to be designed. So, in order to get to the goal stated in the beginning, um, I start with making a point of uh, a new user story that is emerging. And I'm showing here three different vehicles. Uh, we have the Lightyear One, we have uh, the uh, Aptera, and we have the Mercedes EQXX. So these three vehicles are sort of um, the first in a generation, in my opinion, uh, in a trend of vehicles that have really low air drag coefficient. Uh, so I'm talking about 0 0.17, 0 0.13 even uh, in extreme cases that are made with lightweight structures in order to be as light as possible. Of course, have low rolling resistance tires and have, you know, holistically optimized both internal losses of all systems, including the powertrain, as well as uh, thermal management, HVAC, HVAC and, and uh, all the other auxiliary systems that are running on the car. So basically, like it what it used to be in the industry in the past, uh, chasing uh, in sports cars for every gram uh, that you can take off. In this case, you're chasing every every uh, every um, a joule of energy that you can take off, or what hour of energy that you can take off your energy balance. So, if you have a car like this, the user story of this car can be pretty interesting. So, it is feasible to make a car that can go 1,000 kilometer far without any charge and not spending a fortune on the battery. You can imagine to spend 50% less energy. And uh, this is important from two perspectives. One perspective is the energy cost is rising. The second perspective is uh, the infrastructure right now is not capable of, uh, of uh, 
um, a large increase of uh, energy expenditure. So it's important for the electric cars to be adopted that, that also the energy usage goes down as much as the electric car is already much more efficient than a gasoline car. But, you know, we, in the last 100 years, we built a really good infra infrastructure for gas cars. And we, we are still a little bit behind uh, in order to get to where we want to be, let's say in 2030 or even later. Um, let's say uh, one additional user story is if you have a use, useful autonomy without charging. So today I have an electric car. Uh, if anything, my car discharges while being parked. So this is definitely a very interesting user story for many people, I think, especially if you go to places like California or Spain or, or similar. Um, the reduced energy usage is really important for recharging. So uh, if you use less energy, um, think about what you want to recharge for. You're never recharging for the watt hours you get. You're always recharging for range. So basically, if you have 50% lower energy consumption, which is possible with this kind of vehicles compared to the state of the art, then you can also recharge twice faster in terms of range. So really important advantage. And finally, as I will show later, also these kind of vehicles can have, because of some intrinsic properties, in the end, lower dependence on external conditions. And this uh, is one of the Achilles heels today of electric cars. And if you want to build a car that is really useful and covers, covers uh, a nice wide range of user stories, then uh, that's one important aspect. So starting with, let's say, our uh, virtual uh, uh, design or discussion of how to design a, a car that will, uh, that will have uh, um, um, these kind of properties, of course, you need to look at the energy balance. And the energy balance, um, that the part that I will focus on today, uh, doesn't have to do with charging losses, because the charging losses do not let's say at least not extensively impact the, um, um, the, the chase to, uh, to get to 1,000 1, kilometers, but they do impact the recharge, uh, the recharge user story I was talking about before. Uh, however, when you get to discharge losses and then lower in the chain, especially to the power chain losses and the, the vehicle, the vehicle um, uh, road loads, uh, then th these are the major contributors. So, if you want to have a car which is really efficient and, and can fulfill uh, the, the requirements and the, the user stories from before, uh, you need to focus on the air drag. You need to reduce the, both the coefficient of air drag, but also the frontal area of the vehicle. And so you need to think about how do I do my form factor of the vehicle in order to achieve that. Um, you have to focus, of course, on rolling resistance, which on, on the one hand, it's tires, but it's also the rim size, the shape, the form factor. And it's also uh, the reduced vehicle mass because uh, the rolling resistance depends on it as well. Uh, you need to maximize the regeneration availability. So that has to do more, more or less with uh, how you, uh, with the battery that you have, with the battery management system, and what are your limits in terms of that. Um, and uh, it's important to improve the thermal management. So the temperatures in the, in the electric uh, machinery are as low as possible and that you're using as little as possible energy on uh, things like, uh, for example, pumps, uh, pumping the coolant around the circuit. Uh, you need to think, of course, about every component inside of the uh, vehicle, as I said before, but you also need to think, okay, if I want to get to 1000 kilometers, where do I put my additional battery uh, if I'm making a, a car which has a uh, which on one hand has to be um, very good in air drag, it has to be light. So where do I put my battery? So of course, uh, knowing what we focus on uh, here, it's good to make a case for the in-wheel motor. Uh, from our perspective, of course, um, and in-wheel motor motors as the let's say optimal packaging uh, um, uh, technology for the powertrain. They save a lot of space and they save weight on the vehicle level. So uh, an estimation uh, of 200 liters is just a number that you can take uh, uh, take uh, to uh, to see what kind of benefits are possible, uh, and that helps you with uh, let's say releasing the space and allowing you to reduce the the frontal uh, um, area and the, the air drag coefficient. Uh, you can change the shape of the vehicle uh, because of this this new te uh, this technology that we have. You can reduce the vehicle mass again if you have the same space inside that you want for your passengers. You can have a smaller vehicle. By that also, 
intrinsically lighter. Uh, in terms of thermal management, uh, you have less sensitivity to temperature. You don't need to heat parts up as well. Uh, and you have more surface area to cool components because typically in-wheel mo motors are quite good at uh, dissipating heat. Uh, finally, the additional space uh, and possible larger uh, wheelbase with in-wheel motors, that also allows you to have additional space for the battery. Um, just some numbers uh, for calculations. The vehicles um, um, in the future that will utilize all of these advantages, uh, today is clear that it's feasible to get down to 50, maybe 60 watt hours per kilometer in VLTP in terms of energy demand, or in uh, highway cycles slightly higher because of higher speed. So let's say 65 to 80 watt hours per kilometer. So th these are the numbers which are substantially lower than today's vehicles on the market. Now, of course, one thing uh, is to discuss in general terms on the vehicle level, but uh, I want to also get into the role of the power chain in this energy consumption. And this is, this is uh, one of the things that we can influence. And this is, let's say, one of our missions in, in uh, El Afe. Uh, so just first starting with some basics, if we look at the, the right part of the screen, um, uh, I marked uh, with wheel plus and wheel minus the two um, energy requirements at the wheel. So basically, this is the cycle that you would get from a VLTP analysis. So that it's speed and torque that is required on the wheel. Um, and I want to sh I, I want to show here uh, how misleading uh, the power chain efficiency can be. So I've made a, a chart. Uh, in retrospect, this chart is not very smart, but uh, it uh, does the trick in terms of explaining. So we have a, a very simple cycle which has. Uh, an average efficiency of about 80%, so 80.5, but let's call it 80. And you can see the traction power with the full line, which is uh, here marked with wheel plus uh, here, and then the traction power with wheel minus, which is marked, uh, which is marked here um, uh, with the full line again. Um, the, the power chain loss, the loss that is dissipated here is marked with the dashed line. And uh, I, I, I want to, let's say, you to consider um, how would my, um, wh what would be the impact if I improved my system and instead of having 80% efficiency and this amount of losses shown here on the chart, if I had a 90% efficient system, so half, uh, half amount of losses. Um, in order to do that, it's interesting to observe something that uh, you could call a wheel vehicle centered definition of the power chain efficiency. So basically, uh, what the difference between between the energy that is uh, that we need for traction and the energy that is that is available from braking, and uh, divided by the difference between the power that we need from the battery for traction and the power that we get back from regeneration. So that would be sort of a ratio that, uh, that um, um, signifies how efficient, what would be the impact of our system on the overall vehicle efficiency. So if we look at the, the upper part of the equation, uh, we see that the difference between the wheel plus and the wheel minus is actually just the road load in the cycle. And if we look at the, the, uh, the denominator in the equation, we see that it's basically the same thing plus the powertrain losses. So we can rewrite this equation. And th this, is, this is the only part where I use the integrals in, the, in this presentation. So bear with me if you're not too technical. Um, basically, what, what we can write is, what, what we can see immediately is that in vehicles that I was uh, describing before, where the road load uh, is actually getting lower and lower uh, compared to, 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 vehicles, to uh, vehicles on the road today, the power chain loss becomes increasingly important for the efficiency. So uh, this, this is, let's say, the first realization I want to show today. And uh, again, as stated before, um, uh, this is something that, uh, that also drives then the, the design of the machine. Um, so, the 80% system I was describing before, if you write an equation like this, then you actually get to 67%. And okay, this is a number, what does it actually mean? So we'll see. Um, so now we can be get back to the question of what happens if I improve 
the, the my system to 90% efficiency in this specific cycle. Uh, so of course, uh, if, if the answer would be I improve things by 10%, then I wouldn't be asking this question. Uh, and in this very simple cycle, which I, I designed in a way to, to, pro to provide this lesson, uh, we actually get an improvement of 15%. So 10% improvement on efficiency is actually a 15% improvement on the, on the vehicle uh, level, on the vehicle-centered efficiency. And if you consider what I said before, by improving the road loads, you can get even, uh, you can get even bigger differences uh, in this equation because the loss, the loss part becomes more and more important. And we have actually made the loss part half less by, by improving here by 10%. So now, okay, this is all you know theoretical. Just uh, let's say trying to prepare for uh, what I'm going to show in the next slides. Um, so I want to do one more step before I show actually some efficiency maps and some uh, some cases. Um, I want to do another generic case just to show that this logic also works on a cycle, not uh, on a real cycle, not just on a. Uh, on a constructed cycle. So I took a vehicle, uh, a generic vehicle with about 55 watt hours per kilometer vehicle loss in a VLTP cycle. And I took a, five, a 50 kilowatt hour battery. And that's just to start talking about kilometers. So a generic case, but for this generic case from the vehicle simulation, a real cycle and a real, uh, a real case of the uh, um, power chain behind with this kind of an, uh, Average efficiencies, of course, artificially uh, artificially uh, generated. So, in this case, if I had a power chain which would be eighty percent uh, average efficiency on the on this cycle, I would get to about sixty five percent of my vehicle centered efficiency and five hundred and ninety kilometers range. If I had, on the other hand, a ninety uh, percent efficient power chain. I would get to again about 80% vehicle centered efficiency, but that would lead me to 715 kilometers of range. So that's 21% increase. So from this, I think you can see how the range can be really, really impacted by, um, by the efficiency of the powertrain, especially as you go to, to lower and lower um, um, consumptions of the um, um, road loads. And if, so if you reduce the road loads, if you reduce the vehicle mass, that even becomes more and more important. So now going to the powertrain level and checking a comparison between the in-wheel motor and the e-axle and trying to see how each of them comparing this kind of a vehicle and how they should perform. Um, in order to do that, um, we uh, split um, uh, the losses in the, the in both systems into uh, the major contributors. So for the in-wheel motor, we have the joule losses, uh, which go more or less with torque. We have the frequency losses, which go more or less with, with speed, but not only with speed. Uh, we have the seal losses, so basically mechanical environmental protection. We have the inverter losses, cable losses, and vehicle bearing losses. So basically that's that's what comprises the, the efficiency of a in-wheel motor corner, as we call it. If you look at the E-axle and try to get on the same terms, then you have to, again, uh, look at the joule losses. They will go with torque here as well, but the ratio will be different. We have uh, frequency losses, inverter losses, cable losses, but then we also have the gear losses, the drive shafts, the differential and the joint losses. And again, both vehicles, of course, have to have bearings. So this is on equal terms. Um, if we are talking about the specific type of vehicle that we are considering, if we want to get to 1,000 kilometers of range, then we need to consider especially the low, uh, let's call it partial load losses. Uh, we are talking about 10, 15% load of the, uh, of the full uh, uh, power chain capability, even lower in some cases. Uh, and then in this case, it's much, much more important to optimize the frequency losses in the e-motor, uh, in the in the in-wheel motor, the seal losses and the bearing losses. And on the other hand, in the e-axle, very similarly, however, also you need to take care additionally of the gear losses, drive shaft losses and the joint losses. And, and this, is, this is where um, um, a big difference arises between the two systems in the specific uh, class of vehicles. So just 
Uh, I will not touch on the e-axle in terms of what is the focus uh, to improve, but for the for the inward motor, um, you know, really generally speaking, it's very important to address the the losses induced by by the pulse width modulation. Uh, it's important to address the eddy currents uh, in wires, but also in other parts of the system, and it's important to uh, address the seal losses so that the seal losses are are as low as possible while still providing the function that is required of them. So now we get to some real charts and numbers. And uh, uh, on the one hand, we have, uh, a, I, I decided to compare a two wheel drive system. Uh, so a vehicle with a two wheel drive system. So I will start with efficiency map the, so that it can be equal. They will be based on, on the whole axle. So basically, two in-wheel motors and one, one uh, e-axle motor. Um, and on one hand, it's very simple to get the, the in-wheel motor efficiency map. You just need the, the, the motor, the inverter, the cables and, and the bearings, and you get this uh, uh, efficiency map. So um, um, I will address uh, the different regions a bit later when, when I have the e-axle. But in general, this is what a typical in-wheel motor uh, efficiency map would look like. On the other hand, uh, with an e-axle, um, I have to say it's not very easy to get information about it. So a lot of digging, a lot of uh, um, um, uh, interpolation and checking data from charts. Uh, and sometimes it's uh, interesting because um, the data is really not realistically shown, like in this case. So the, the very low torques, of course, uh, the efficiency has to drop quite dramatically because uh, there, there's no... Uh, no produced power at zero torque, um, but they're not shown. So it's difficult to take this kind of charts into consideration. So in this case, uh, we took what was available uh, um, uh, on the, um, um, let's say publicly, we cannot take things that, that, are, that, are, that we have and are not, are not available. Uh, and we constructed from that, so from these two, so from the uh, E-Drive and from the gearbox efficiency map, we constructed an efficiency map of an e-axle. Um, so this is a composite data of something that's publicly available. And of course, uh, it's not my intention to say that this is either the best or that is the only way that uh, the, the e-axle's uh, efficiency looks like. On the contrary, there can be many different ways to optimize. And as we saw before, uh, the efficiency hotspot can be can be uh, um, in the middle of the chart, it can move around. However, what's really common to all of these uh, um, EXL efficiency maps is that they start declining quite rapidly when you get to lower out uh, to low output torques. And this has to do with the losses that you cannot get rid of the residual losses in the gears. So just a comparison between these two maps, if you, uh, uh, take a vehicle like we like we discussed before, um, the generic vehicle with very low consumption. And if you uh, give it a, a 67.5 kilowatt hour battery, you'll see why I chose that number. You get to around 768 kilometers of range on the highway. Uh, while with the other efficiency map that is operating a lot of time in the low efficiency area, you get to around 635 um, kilometers. So that's a 21% difference in range. And as you see, the peak efficiencies, it's even better if you, if you would look closely, it's even better in the E-Axel. Uh, the, the high torque efficiency, it's even much better in some, in some areas uh, in an E-Axel. However, when you go to, to a cycle which is relevant, let's say for range, you get a 21% difference uh, in, in favor of the in-wheel motor. If you look at the VLTP cycle, uh, with that, this size of the battery, so 67.5 kilowatt hours was enough in this analysis to actually get us to 1,000 kilometers of range, so the, the range that we wanted to achieve in this analysis. On the other hand, the same battery, the same vehicle, but this other efficiency map, we get only to 800 kilometers. So you can see there's a huge difference um, between these two cases, and, and this is uh, just in terms of numbers more than 25% difference. If you go one step further, and if you start thinking about, okay, what happens if it's cold? So uh, how do different systems behave? And this is, for me, this is uh, gets really interesting because I own an electric car and uh, uh, winters are um, interesting. 
I would say, uh, in terms of trip planning. Uh, if you have experience in going somewhere in the summer, you have to be really careful not to uh, over plan in terms of when you will arrive somewhere. Um, so what's important to understand is that it's not only the battery that deteriorates with cold, it's also other components in the car that can have an influence. So for example, in the, in the in-wheel motor, uh, the vehicle bearing losses, they do increase when it's very cold outside. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the EXO, all of the gear losses, all of the drive shaft losses and the joint losses, they are very sensitive to cold. So, uh, you know, the, the typical operating temperature of a gear train, uh, optimal operating temperature of a gear train is around 80, 90 degrees. And when you go down to 10, 20, 30 degrees, the, the losses increase by two or by four. And this maybe in, a, in a, a bigger SUV vehicle that does not have a mission profile of the vehicle that I was talking about before, that maybe that's acceptable, but it has a huge impact as you will see on, on vehicles like, like uh, um, uh, Lightyear, Aptera or uh, Mercedes EQXX. So the corrected maps, so both of these maps are now corrected for the additional losses. Um, and the numbers change, of course. Uh, on one hand, in the inwheel motor system, um, they change a little bit. So, okay, we are not hitting any more the 1,000 kilometer range, that's fine. Uh, but on the other hand, you can see a considerable drop and a change in, in the relative uh, range difference between the two, the two systems. So you can see that in the winter, there's really a big, big difference between uh, how much uh, the, the inward motor powertrain um, deteriorates and how much the e-axle powertrain deteriorates. Uh, and that's, that's also going to be important if we want to have the electric vehicles really widespread in a lot of different areas in the world. So to summarize a little bit what uh, I tried to communicate and hopefully, hopefully did it clearly. Um, and also, you know, putting a little bit of a disclaimer to, to all of these numbers that I've shown here. Of course, this is just one efficiency map and I'm not claiming at all that this is the best efficiency map, as I said before. And these numbers here are just an example. Uh, however, even in an optimized uh, geared power chain, an EXL, there will always be gear train, drive shaft and differential losses because you just need those components if you, if you want to have a, a system like that. And the amount of these losses is really, really well correlated with the cost of gears. So uh, in terms of uh, how accurately the, the gears need to be made and also what kind of materials are used, uh, what kind of lubricants are used and so on. Um, you, I, I think I successfully showed and I, I'm looking forward to also to feedback uh, on the contrary that um, direct drive solutions are less prone and let's say intrinsically less prone to secondary effects on temperature and that these effects are actually quite considerable and, and taking into account the amount of losses in today's gear train, which are still, as you saw, the efficiency map very, very um, efficient. Uh, it's difficult to imagine the gearbox really heating up to the I don't know, 20 uh, kilo gearbox really heating up to 90 degrees very fast in the cycle. So it, it should be a considerable amount of uh, uh, additional loss versus the uh, heated up system for the for the VLTP measurement uh, uh, at the re uh, uh, regulator. Uh, it would um, um, it would most probably have an impact three quarters of the year or even possibly uh, the whole year round on the real use of the vehicle. Um, so the gains that I've shown uh, 20, 30, even 36%, I think was the highest number of difference between the direct drive and uh, an e-axle. However, it's clear that this can be optimized and we did some uh, quick estimations and, and uh, uh, analysis. And uh, we still think that the, the lower boundary is about 10 to 15% difference. Um, if you compare the optimal e-axle that we imagine being done and, and the inwheel motor as it is today um, in some, in some uh, uh, project that we have. Um, in terms of uh, all of these numbers, it's difficult. We are not a vehicle uh, maker, so it's difficult for us to judge all of the uh, how all of the benefits on aerodynamics and weight of inwheel motors could actually add up. Uh, and this is definitely work for the future, both uh, together with OEMs and for ourselves. Um, 
but this is not considered in the analysis and this is an additional benefit. So uh, how well the floor can actually be made smooth in terms of aerodynamics, how well the shape of the car can, can, be, can be improved and, and so on. Uh, and of course, we are not stopping. This is the current state of the inwell motor technology and uh, we are working on further improving. And of course, uh, the, others, uh, the other competitors are for sure working on, on it as well. Just to conclude, uh, I think we've shown that it's not really so far away that uh, we can get to 1,000 kilometers uh, per charge uh, if we do it in a holistic way on the vehicle level, but then also on each component, including the powertrain. Uh, it is uh, quite obvious that the, the user story of this kind of a vehicle is very compelling. And uh, you know, talking to several people after uh, also Mercedes revealed the EQXX platform. Um, a lot of people are very excited for this kind of vehicles uh, becoming more and more, um, um, let's say, a trend. Um, and, and I think that we will be using this kind of vehicles in the future more and more. Uh, in terms of the um, uh, vehicle road loads, um, uh, I think we've shown that the, the low road low load region is increasingly important and that the vehicle mass is increasingly important and uh, that we will see the, the cold weather impact uh, as quite important in the, in the vehicle design in the future as well. Um, the inwheel motor has, has been shown to be really a good solution for this kind of vehicles and uh, even further enabling uh, some additional vehicle level import, uh, important uh, gains. Um, so yeah, so this is, uh, you know, I want to say it's, it's quite a generic analysis. I cannot show really a lot of data, uh, but I want to say also the, via, uh, the, the numbers and the, uh, the benefits that I was talking about, this is something that is today. So this is not uh, something in the future, but it's today. And this kind of vehicles will be driving uh, with customers very, very soon. Thank you. What else? Thank you. Uh, we, have came to, we came to the end of the, today's webinar. Uh, if you are not following us on LinkedIn yet, uh, make sure to do so. And of course, to uh, have an opportunity to join webinars in the future too. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you.